the agenda for this gathering is really um, rather simple. Um, I wrote in the uh, article that I did for the pre-conference session that one of the things I have learned from um, looking at research around um, assessing children's learning um, and engaging in assessment processes is that we often, when we um, work with adults, think in really complex ways about some of the things we want to do um, and we have set goals and we are doing um, evaluation forms and we're, uh, some of us work in settings where we have to hit certain marks that have been established by others, whether it's school settings that have standards of learning or um, uh, the American Theological uh, Association or similar kinds of places that establish certain things that degree programs have to have or congregations that have set up their goals. Uh, and so we often think of it in a kind of quantitative way of uh, working through that. And even here in the REA, we have an evaluation or assessment form, feedback form that has some Likert scales and some other kinds of things. Um, but one of the things that I've been learning from that work and assessment with kids um, is that there's really a movement to start focusing on sort of key insights and lingering questions and shifting perspectives from beginning to end. Um, and putting this program together um, when we weren't even sure if it's going to be in person or online initially, uh, limited in some ways how many different kinds of things we could try this time around. So some of the ideas I talked about in that paper were things like asking people to do a one minute video at the beginning about um, how they would answer the a question, um, whose children are they or who's responsible, and then inviting people to do another one at the end or creating um, a um, map of, you know, a sort of concept map of what we were thinking, et cetera. Um, and I will confess, I simply ran out of steam in trying to put together that more complicated and then explain to people what I hoped from them around that. But the notion of sharing key insights and lingering questions um, was one that we were able to implement. And we asked that on the assessment forms after each session. And now I want to open the floor and invite you to think about that uh, at this stage, as you look back over this week and you think about all the things you've heard and experienced and maybe the thoughts you were having when you were off screen as you um, were fixing uh, dinner or uh, dealing with pets or family or extended family, um, what kinds of things are sticking with you um, as you come to the end of REA 2023? Um, so I'm going to invite you to just name aloud as you're um, interested those kinds of things. And I'm gonna make some notes um, and I'll share that Google doc with you um, uh, in a little bit, but I wanna keep us all on screen as much as possible. So I'm not gonna put it up right now, um, but I'd love to hear um, and talk about perhaps even some of the key insights or lingering questions that you have as you've come to this uh, last session of REA 2023. So, if you'd like to say something, um, unmute or drop things in the chat and we'll follow the conversation in both ways. I'm consciously uh, talking a lot when I'm on, um, but it's been a, a very, very interesting time. So for me, some of the key insights were the uh, looking again at the uh, developmental stages for children and uh, reassessing their capacities. Uh, I appreciated the fact that that kind of research is going on. I, I had not heard of allo parenting and the uh, the role of the responsibility of uh, the whole congregation. We, we talk about it in our baptismal uh, service, uh, but trying to help parents um, understand that they're not the sole responsible people to, uh, responsible adults, uh, to do the um, spiritual education for children, I think is really helpful if, if we can get that through to, uh, to new parents. Um, the grandparent, in my situation uh, in Australia, it's often the grandparents who are doing that spiritual education uh, and uh, trying to help, help people. Um, 
for me, uh, one of the wonderful statements was um, that uh, on the first, first day, I think it was, repudiate does not rescind or repair uh, in terms of justice with uh, First Nations people. Uh, and uh, we in Australia are talking about trying to have a, a, a Aboriginal folks being able to have a voice to parliament and there's terrible uh, division over just allowing that kind of voice. Uh, so it kind of reminds me of, of the uh, restrictions of children's voices. Um, so uh, that's enough, but thank you. It's been a wonderful conference and I really have appreciated the times I've been here. And I particularly thank you for the ways in which you've tried to put um, times around the world together. Uh, and, and so that has um, basically worked for me. I, I ended up not being able to do uh, too many of the, the midnight ones, but thank you, blessings. Thanks, Beth. Someone else. I'll say that uh, part of what I, uh, with missing some of the sessions, which I'm going to be watching on video, but uh, because of the events in my family, but uh, just getting the wide variety of uh, experiences and uh, Elizabeth was talking about you know, the different times at 7 a.m. this morning. Uh, it was wonderful, all of the different uh, uh, papers on marginalization, discrimination, and religious education responses. And to getting, uh, in, in a sense, you know, from those contexts, uh, what's going on in those contexts, but also different perspectives <laughs> from the lived praxis of the scholars who were presenting. Uh, and then, if I may, one, one takeaway, uh, Karen Marie, was actually uh, going back was from your paper and presentation, which went along with mine. We were in the same uh, session, Karen Marie and I, our papers. Uh, but realizing that part of our work is uh, the assumptions about children and faith that are brought by uh, religious educators and local congregations and uh, and parents um, that that might be counter to what we we have. So it's not just the children that we're educating here, but it's a, a continued call for me, uh, the education about children and religious education uh, that that we need to be providing in different ways to our our parents, uh, our uh, Sunday school teachers, uh, religious educators in, in a variety of roles. Thanks, Russ. Others. Well, I'll jump in and, and uh, offer a couple thoughts. Um, I was, uh, what I'll take, one of the things I'll take with me is the notion of the moral agency of infants, where they were talking about, uh, you know, babies having the ability to express preferences I just that just blows me away I think it's that's amazing uh, and I guess um, one of the things that that tells me about coming from a practitioner standpoint is as I'm not in the field keeping up with all the newest information all the time like I suspect the scholars are so sometimes uh, these things are are new uh, to people I mean they're not new to you all but they're new to those us out in the uh, in the churches, or in our congregations, our uh, settings, and uh, so I'm I'm always delighted to find out new information like that. But I'll just remind everybody that's not always um, that's not that's new to me, but it may, may not feel new to you. But it's important to share. Uh, also, I'll comment on the the power of stories to open up new ways of viewing children and their theological agency. I think about the the stories that were shared in the in the last session about the, the children who engaged in these very detailed conversations with their parents about God and what was going on. I just you can tell people about that, but my experience is that when you hear the stories, it just makes so much difference in terms of the people making connections with uh, with that. Um, do you want us to talk about lingering questions also? 
Sure. Okay, I, I just had one for now. I may have others as we go, but uh, from a practical standpoint, what are some ways to create and nurture the safe spaces we're going to need in order to address these issues, in not in our in our our universities, in our churches, in our culture? How how do we do that? Go for a big question there. Uh, I, this is it, it's truly a challenge. I, I will I'll um, just say in response to that, um, one of the sessions I was in, I think the same one you were, where they were sharing the stories and also about the um, Godly Play Foundations yes. interviews, uh, etc. Um, this whole thing about you know um, what it is that parents want for their children from religion and how religion is depicted in the wider culture which is antithetical to what parents want for their children. And while parents who've already made the choice to be religiously affiliated may not be as affected by that, um, a recent Barna study showed that six out of 10 millennial parents were not themselves participants in religious activities as children. So they're not already religiously inclined and therefore may be quite suspect because of this piece. So it just, for me, that, that how, do, how do we change the image of religion um, in the broader culture? I think it's a huge piece of creating those safe spaces, but I don't know the answer to how we do that so much as that I know it's a question we have to wrestle with. So others in terms of key insights and lingering questions. Karen Marie, if I could, um, I've just been, you know, we're working on this, this collection of reflections and talking with a lot of my grown-up youth who are themselves millennials, um, who are writing, who are now parents who are writing these reflections. And one of the things I observed was I needed to say to them, it's okay if your language is not super religious, which made me say, maybe that's a piece of where the church is falling down. Like maybe we need to get out of our jargon because uh, I think the way we talk about things definitely impacts people's impression of what the thing is. So people would say yes to me to write a thing that wasn't super Jesus-y <laughs> as long as they felt like that was okay. Like their way of parenting didn't have to be explicitly religious in the ways that they might have characterized previously. Thank you. Someone else, a key insight, a lingering question. What's on your mind at the end of this REA 2023? Uh, Karen Marie, thanks very much yes. for your uh, work and everybody else's work involved in uh, this uh, conference. Um, I, uh, I thought it was very good. And uh, the, the advantage, the advantage for me of uh, an online conference is, am I in and out on, uh, okay, my, my screen keeps fading in and then comes back in and now I'm frozen. We, we, we can see and hear you. Yeah, you, oh, there's oh. a slight lag, but you're still coming through. Okay, fine. Uh, maybe if uh, you, if I simply completely freeze, if you raise your hand or something, Karen Marie, that'll uh, be a signal anyway, because my image is next, right next to yours on the, the screen here. Okay. Um, anyway, I was saying for me, uh, the advantage of the online, uh, uh, format and uh, structure uh, is such that uh, I, I have no distractions. <laughs> uh, I simply uh, get away from my house here in St. John's and uh, spend the week on campus and do nothing except uh, have meals and uh, attend uh, sessions and uh, sleep so that's the work of my week and it's been a very refreshing and uh, i was able to get much more involved in the conference than uh, the typical uh in-person meeting 
uh, simply because you don't have to, I, I didn't have to go anywhere, move anywhere, uh, simply uh, attend and take care of these other essentials. Um, Another aspect of the uh, uh, conference that I was uh, <clears throat> really enjoyed was the variety of those who attended. And uh, one came to mind where you have people who have many years in the field of religious education and others attending, some others attending, seem to be pretty well at the beginning of their if they're going to make it a career, uh, certainly at the beginning of their studies. Uh, and I thought that was uh, such a wonderful uh, spread. Uh, and people generally willing to uh, speak up and you know, ask questions, that kind of thing. Another aspect of variety has to do with location. Um, and uh, it was interesting. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth already mentioned and, and uh, the uh, hours involved. And uh, it was just an uh, interesting sense. Uh, I can be at the same time in a session with uh, myself here and someone in America and someone in Indonesia. And uh, all of us coming probably from quite different uh, graduate programs and higher education and so on. And uh, the third had to do with the variety of cultures and getting some insight from the point of view of religious educators in their own culture as to what problems the culture was presenting. Whereas oftentimes the uh, uh, in-person meetings of REA focused on North American uh, and uh, essentially American, but North American, including Canada, uh, in terms of its issues and problems and history and, and the like, whereas this way there were glimpses into others. Uh, so anyway, those were the positive things and I'm not gonna take up a half hour on uh, issues that I found, not in the content, but in uh, the, the manner of this type of conference, but I'll come back to that. Yeah, Dory. No, I'm jealous of the way you approached this week. I think that sounds beautiful to just give away that <laughs> not way it happened for me, but I do love that idea. Um, something is sitting with me that it's not a new issue. I think I felt it at the last five REAs I've attended, maybe longer, but I wonder if it's sitting for anyone else and, and if anyone wants to be a conversation partner with me around it. As um, positions in seminary, in speaking from the North American and Christian theological education context, uh, as positions in religious education become fewer and fewer, from the Christian denominational um, context as uh, church positions on staffs that are named religious educator, even spiritual formation become fewer and fewer. It feels like part of the task of this goal is of the, part of the goal of this guild or the task of this guild might, to, might be to help people identify what portion of their vocation is religious education. Um, if you're not coming mentored through, I, imagine most of the people like me came here because they had someone like Jack Seymour tell them to get to this guild, that this guild would be a good place for them. As we see more people with multiple vocational identities, especially those who work in faith worlds that are not always gonna be fully paying over the next 20 to 50 years, we're gonna be seeing people as I am already in my work who are, um, you know, I used to say cobbling together, but now I think they're doing it very mindfully. They're creating innovative paths towards doing um, ministry writ large and many, and, and you know, a portion of that is religious education from my perspective. I'm thinking of college chaplains, I'm thinking of chaplain chaplains in hospital settings. Um, and I'm thinking of activists and uh, people who are doing social change and uh, social entrepreneurship, people in the social equity fields who are doing neighborhood economics. There's so much religious education going on in those spaces. So I wanna know who is, having that conversation about how those of us who are part of the guild help 
do that task of helping others name religious education as part of the vocation of this more broad changing landscape of, you know, from my perspective, religion in America, but I have a hunch globally, it's already been happening, right? So I'm just curious if anyone else is thinking about that. I don't even know how to name it, but I know it's been a, it's been an edge for me for several years at REA as I try to recruit who I think might be who I think might, and there's so many benefits to guild membership. Um, uh, and and they just benefit from this collegiality, from the place. So anyway, anyone who's thinking about that, please let me know. Thanks, Corey and Noel. Um, and I do want to just underscore what's also what's happening here, particularly for those coming in. As we talk about key insights and lingering questions, from REA 2023, it doesn't only have to be about the content, it can also be about the experience one had and the way and the questions, as Dory's pointed out, that may have come across multiple REAs and were still present in this annual meeting. So while I certainly welcome key insights and lingering questions related to the content of the conference, I also want to affirm and encourage people to share key insights and lingering questions that come from the experience of the conference and the experience of being part of an REA gathering um, that may link to other bigger questions for the Guild. So thank you uh, to both of you on that. Who else has key insights and lingering questions? Um, I have some process questions, but I'm, I'm kind of more interested in waiting for that. I, I have something that follows on what Dory was just saying. Um, in addition to, so yes, religious education is happening in all kinds of more spaces and by all kinds of more people. But I kind of wonder if that doesn't even have to increase because of the fact that parents had no church growing up. And so are they, how could they offer that to their kids? How could they even know a place where that might be available? Um, unless they're in, um, uh, you know, community development organization or something, but mostly they're working their asses off trying to support their kids. Excuse my language. Um, so the question I've been wondering about is um, how does religious education, how do those of us in the guild expand our horizons to see about how we educate in the places these people hang out in. Young people, young parents, and where are they hanging out? Well, part of that is the web. And I guess that's part of why I'm thinking about, um, part of why I'm thinking about chat GPT and what can we do with that? Um, so I feel like I'm blathering now, so I'm going to stop, <laughs> but it that gets at a little of it. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, just a comment on what Dory had to say, and it's uh, reflected a bit in what uh, Eileen had to say. Uh, the situation you described for uh, religious education and religious educators uh, is uh, similar uh, to the issues that AAR have been dealing with the American Academy of Religion for a number of years. And that is uh, the same thing is happening at least at the university and uh, to a certain extent, even at the private in America and the private high school uh, or private school, religiously affiliated schools of uh, the the uh, de decline in the numbers of staff who are actually involved in the area of religious studies. And uh, at least in Canada, uh, 
I recall being in a session uh, earlier this year with the Canadian Society for the Study of Religion. And uh, one of the uh, leaders of the CSSR uh, noted that in the past 10 years, he has had 10 different positions within his university as they keep shifting him around, uh, fitting religious studies somehow in with everything from physical education to, uh, uh, I forget what another ob fairly obscure and distant uh, discipline would be. Uh, but the, the same problem is there. So what is this wider field that people who had been involved in religious studies, but can no longer find a job directly related to it, um, is able to do with the kind of uh, academic preparation and personal preference that they have. So uh, it, it's, it's bigger, it, it has to do with religion more than simply with religious education and its role and uh, regard within society. Thanks, Noel. So I'm gonna um, invite us to still keep thinking about key findings or lingering questions, but also to maybe think about what our hopes for the future are, because in some ways, um, some of what we're starting to name now are hopes for the future of religious education more generally. Um, and I'm also wondering what our hopes for the future of children's religious education are. Um, and so I want to open that up, as well as the possibility of going back to key insights and lingering questions, to just say, um, now that we've spent a week focusing on children's religious education and uh, the religious education of parents and caregivers in relation to children and youth, um, what do you hope for in the future? Well, while others are collecting their thoughts, <laughs> Uh, one thing I hope for has to do with the uh, religious congregations in all religions, where it would be wonderful if every one of the uh, uh, participants in the structure of the religion, <clears throat> uh, that is the participating institutions, uh, would put religious education pretty much uh, if not in first place, then second place within the institution, uh, rather than relying on volunteers, for example, who may or may not have much preparation for them, or simply not allowing time. Uh, I can think of my own parish in St. John's that uh, religious education, in terms of actually meeting with the religious education staff, um, <clears throat> meet uh, after, uh, pardon me, be, uh, at, uh, before the readings in mass at, toward the beginning of uh, the service, and they return uh, just before the uh, canon of the mass. Uh, so it's about 20 minutes that they're out altogether. And that doesn't... Uh, by no means is that sufficient time to make any kind of impact on children as they grow toward adulthood. And then there's nothing for youth in the parish. And part of this is they can't find people who want to participate in it. But anyway, that's, my hope would be that uh, there be as much push on uh, religious education as there is on fundraising, for example. Uh, within the pair. Thanks, Noel. Yes, Russ. I just want to pick up on uh, uh, some things, uh, uh, several of uh, the, the more recent comments uh, and in the chat uh, where, where Mary brings up the, uh, the changing landscape uh, of, of religion. And, and there's a lot where we need to, be innovative and, and no brings up the you know shrinking of religion departments, the shrinking of uh, uh, seminary and divinity school faculties, uh, and and part of the struggle, uh, well the shrinking number of education specialists in congregations, 
right, in communities of faith. And I think, you know, we, we appreciate the broader approach uh, and, and would strive for that. I always tell my students, even if they're going to be an associate pastor, say, focused on educational ministry, that uh, they need to have a place at the table with the, the worship team, the deacons, the, the mission team, you know, because it's all it has uh, educational uh, implications. Um, but there's this power issue that if you say, and say, I'll talk about the academy. If you say, hey, these are all related. We shouldn't have all these separate siloed disciplines. Um, and so for our, dis for our curriculum, we're not going to require all of these classes. The fear uh, I know amongst my colleagues who are younger than, than I am and in the field is, in the practice of ministry fields is they'll just uh, say that we're not essential, <laughs> you know, or they'll say uh, that we don't need uh, an, uh, an educator in, in a local congregation uh, if it's all inclusive. Now, we need to change, <laughs> right? Our, our curriculum needs to change. The way that we approach things need to change. Uh, but I think part of the issue is for those of us who are religious educators and who have positions is to recognize the risk and being able to take the, the risk as we move together and think, how do we reorganize ourselves, uh, whether it's in the academy or in uh, denominations and in, in, uh, re religious uh, groups, adj adjudicatories, or in local congregations. Uh, what's the best for this uh, changing world in which we live? Thank you. Karen, if I could jump in. Yes, please. I was just going to say, we have some folks who haven't spoken yet. Please take your turn. Okay. Uh, Paulette Isaac Savage, University of Missouri, St. Louis. So I serve as a professor of adult education, but I do a lot of research on the uh, Black church. And Russell, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the challenges that we have in adult education. I serve as president of the American Association for Adult and Continuing Education. And one of the things that we are seeing as well is the demise of a lot of our adult graduate adult education programs. So we've been having some of those same conversations. You know, what do we do, you know, about this? We have um Faculty, as they retire, of course, their positions are not being filled, um, and some of our thriving programs are now defunct. So one of the things that we've talked about is really being deliberate about collaborating, uh, cross-listing courses, if at all possible. Um, and we, too, are finding that we have students who are graduating with a doctorate and really no place to go. And so so that's a, that's a challenge for us as well. But I think being uh, collaborative is going to be very important for us, even, you know, with uh, religious education. And as you were talking about, or maybe that was Noel talking about the uh, church, I think it's important that, you know, in the church that we, as somebody thinks, put in the chat, really try to spark our young people's interest in religion, uh, in faith, whatever faith that may be. But I think we had to get to them really, really young. So it's important to have those programs within our churches, parishes, et cetera, that can help spark that interest for our children and for our youth as well. Thank you, Paulette. As you're continuing to think, I'm just going to share screen. Um, briefly only because I again want to come back to be able to see where everybody is but just just so you can see the document that's being created if you haven't um, clicked through to it yourself um, there are days I'm very grateful that I learned to type a lot of words a minute when I was in middle school um, but so we've got a list going here these are our um, key insights and uh, lingering questions um, and I've tried to copy things from chat and then of course, moving towards our hopes for the future. Um, and I will change that heading to say for religious education more generally too, but I haven't gotten a backtrack yet. Um, so 
And Karen, I have a question, and maybe this has been addressed, and I apologize if I'm repeating something that's already been said, but have we thought about, and I've been a member of REA off and on since um, maybe 2001, something like that, but have we thought about collaborating with other organizations uh, as it relates to like hosting a conference, collaborating on hosting a conference? Have we done that, or is that something that we've talked about? Okay, I see Mary, Mary shaking her yeah. head. Mary, okay. you want to say just a little about the yeah, history? Yeah, can I chime in a little bit there? Um, sure. We have, in as many ways as we can think of, tried to talk about this. We've done some collaboration with Alam, for instance, the Association of Lifelong Learning, um, anyway, for ministry. We've talked about oh, doing yeah. stuff with ATFI. We've talked about um, doing things in particular regional settings with local groups. Um, we've talked about... Um, Oh gosh, um, AYME. I mean, I think one of the challenges is what what do we offer as a volunteer organization that can be helpful to other organizations? And um, I think I don't. I, I, one of the things I worry about is how much each organization is trying to um, keep itself alive, and and sometimes I think we have to take bigger risks. But if you have one, Paulette, that you think would be a great one to collaborate with, you should let the steering committee know or the advisory council because I'm really sure there'd be interest. Okay. I think thank you. I, I Nothing think comes to mind right now, but just the idea of us collaborating. I know with another organization that I'm involved with, um, every at least it used to be pre-COVID, every three years we would co-host a conference with an organization in Canada. We haven't done that in a while since COVID, but we used to do that almost every three years. The, uh, um, I this, if I could ahead. just uh, align one minute, I just want to say this is similar to the academic disciplines issue. I just want to flag that the survival of disciplines and the survival of organizations may be issues for us to think about. Um, Eileen? The big chaplaincy organizations, um, there's five of them. Um, most years they do their own thing. Every five years, at least up until COVID, they were doing it together so that all of the chaplains, the Catholic, the Jewish, APC, Canadians, and I don't remember who the fifth group was, um, but they, they found a way to do that as an every five year thing. I will note that one of the things that um, REA did quite a long time ago and still is trying to keep doing is a session at AAR every year, partly as a way to help raise visibility of the stuff we're working on and another way to get people to network. Um, but I think we should stop looking only to scholarly associations and reach out more broadly the same way all these denominational staff and, and stuff are falling away. A lot of the practice organizations, like the Lutheran Association of Christian Educators, the Presbyterian Christian Educators, some of these groups that were really strong for a number of years are having a hard time um, maintaining the kind of stuff that they were doing. And you know, maybe there's a way that we could collaborate in that way. Uh, there is a, uh, I see a problem here. REA has its its uh, goal, I think, to be as diverse as possible in terms of what religious groups participate in uh, facing the problem of education, regardless of what the religious background might be. Uh, whereas uh, most of the other, or all of the other associations that I can think of are concerned with religious education are really focused on their own uh, a church or uh, religious tradition, background, and education within that. So I don't see a, a comfortable fit uh, between REA and uh, uh, virtually all other groups concerned with religious education. Uh, for that reason. Uh, so it's certainly worth uh, thinking about and trying, but um, I, I just don't see the feasibility of it and why REA would be welcome 
at, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, uh, what's it called, the Catholic Catechetical Association or whatever. Uh, I've forgotten no, the name. No, I'll just note that I think um, denominational groups, or at least some of the ones I am affiliated with or connected to through uh, Union Seminary, um, that they too are starting to think more broadly. Um, the what the organization that used to be known as the Association of Presbyterian Church Educators voted to change their name last year to the Association of Partners for Christian Education, precisely because there are five denominations that actually collaborate in the annual meeting that makes up um, APSI. And um, that I noticed uh, that I am not the only REA member who will be presenting at APSI um, and doing workshops and things. So I think um, that there's a shift going on there again, some of it coming out of um, the difficulty of maintaining, a, uh, you know, staying in the black in terms of budgets, et cetera. And so looking for more cooperation. And I also think um, that there's uh, that there have been various grantors who've been encouraged that, et cetera. So while I think um, I think your caution is one that's good for us to pay attention to, I also think the landscape is shifting in ways that we might want to test those waters. Other thoughts here, and I'm I'm gonna yeah. I see that same not, note from Vaughn. Thank you, Vaughn. <laughs> Um, I just had I had a, a structural um, reflection that I appreciated and then thought for future this would be neat to hone in on more but um, Russell and Karen your presentation yesterday I appreciated that there was a, a theological framework and then more of a practical framework and you had dialogued prior to that about how the intersection between your two um, papers and your thought uh, and as a as a viewer of sort of seeing that dynamic, it was neat to watch. And I would have I was like, oh, I wish I had done that with the other um, presenters that were in my session because it would have been interesting to just have our own little dialogue to bring to the workshop. So I really appreciated that. Um, the other thing I wanted to name just that I've been thinking about, and this is, comes from. Um, a newbie in REA. Um, this is my first time joining a conference and I've read the journal um, for many years, but that's about it. Um, really a lot of highlighting the agency of children um, as spiritual beings who have their own spiritual experiences and experiences with God and theological reflections. Um, and I wonder about our definitions of religious education and if we've done some work to um, look at our definitions or our frameworks with which we approach religious education from centering our recognition of children as agents who have spiritual experiences of God, whether or not they are um, a part of a religious institution. Um, you know, and I think I, that kind of also makes me think about our conversation around parents. If they have, if they didn't grow up in the church, what does that mean for them? And what does that mean for religious education? Um, and there are, you know, thinking more broadly about the many ways that parents are engaging in content or community that is really deeply spiritual, that may not look like um, the, the formal religious education that we, the frameworks that we come to. So on being was someone named on being, I think, um, you know, there's a resurgence of interest in these types of um, ways of engaging spirituality. Um, so yeah, I just wonder, I just wonder about what that, what that means for our kind of uh, collective understanding of religious education. Thanks, Heather. We have um, a little less than 15 minutes left in our session. Um, there are a few folks who I can see um, identifying markers on screen um, that I we haven't heard from in chat or orally. So if uh, any of you want to jump in, uh, please do so now. We'll we'll just give about we'll give a pause to see if anybody who hasn't spoken uh, will decide they want to speak up, and then we'll open it up again to everybody. That also lets me keep up on copying chat. <laughs> 
Um, I'm one of those who has not spoken up or typed up uh, a <laughs> figure. Uh, I, I can I can say a little something. Um, I will say that as a uh, single mom, I did not get to chime in a whole lot during this conference, which was difficult. And I'm sure that you know other people in various time zones had similar challenges. Um, and I appreciate this conversation now looking at our field. And Dory, I know that you are connected with some of these Lily Grant initiatives I wonder if that's a really good place to be starting to make some connections because it's all about religious education. I mean, I'm, I am now involved with three of these, <laughs> um, Lily Grants, which is the life of a contingent faculty person at a seminary that no longer has a Christian education budget line. But, you know, the, the, these are huge opportunities with lots of seminaries who are educating churches who are educating um i mean I, just from from what we do we're educating church teams and we're educating leaders and the you know we're in the um you know young adult area and the parenting and the children area you know i think there's a whole lot of um religious education that's happening through these grants but i don't see a lot of those people connected with REA and I just wonder where, where those lines of connection might be helpful and it also uh, connects Dory to your ideas about thinking about you know innovation or social entrepreneurship and and you know it's all practical theology as a big umbrella but um, in these specific grants they're age level targeted educating churches and educating people in churches. And I think um, there might be some connection there that we could be exploring. I think that's a great point. Yeah, and I'll just note one of the reasons for um, proposing this topic is because I have a Lilly grant for children's spirituality and written into that grant was to try and find some way to get REA thinking about it. I didn't know it would be this way exactly when I wrote the grant, but that, um, so it's an intersection with a Lilly grant and REA. Yes, yeah, and I was, I was uh, feeling the wave that you were riding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll open it back up to anyone who wants to, uh, share. Um, we've got a lot of issues that um, have been named, um, and you might want to say more on something that someone's already raised, or there might be something else that comes to mind that you want to share. Um, what else in terms of key insights, lingering questions, or hopes would you like to name? I'll, I, I've already spoken, but I'll just briefly say this is uh, sort of along the line of hopes for our guild uh, to be recognized. This is sort of counter to what I've been talking in the chat is going in the opposite direction of academic uh, institutions or academic guilds. But uh, last year I had the opportunity to present at the Association for Moral Education uh, annual meeting, an, an international uh, guild. And uh, during their wrap up session like this, several people said, we actually, for the first time in memory, had somebody in religious education present at the conference and it, you know it was well received and they were excited about it and noted that it was bringing a different perspective to even that guild so just in our mission to be and I know many of you do this where you go out and uh you know the finding different places to present and and sort of representing uh religious education um I en encourage us all to just share our insights uh, beyond our our guild. And uh, Elizabeth, uh, I'm just wondering whether people have uh, experienced resistance to religious education or to uh, educated religious education. Um, the the lay people who are doing religious education in schools. I know that's foreign uh, to uh, folks in the US. Um, there, in Australia, there has been this strange uh, rejection of those of us who actually are trained in the field uh, in the uh, by folk from the um, 
more Pentecostal uh, churches who who just don't want our scholarship. They don't, want, they don't even want biblical scholarship. Uh, they just want to have the enthusiasm of sharing Jesus. So the evangelism stuff um, absolutely overrides the education stuff. So that's one thing. The other thing is, listen, uh, you know, in my ministry, uh, I have in the congregation, I'm constantly using my religious education uh, ideas. So creating a Lenten program using the Oberammergau um, script for the for the Lenten studies has absolutely used it in the Palm Sunday day, uh, service. Um, you know, one one is constantly using religious education ideas and the the modern ways in which we're doing it. So I just think so much um, contribution happens uh, at local congregational levels by folk who are trained in the field and can use the insights. So. Um, blessings on you all. Thank you. I wondered, um, well, two bits of process struck me this time, and I don't know if I don't even like myself, I'm not sure that I think what I'm about to suggest is a good idea. Cause I've I've only like it, I noticed one side of it and haven't thought through the other side. Two things. One, um I one's very minor. In the poster session last night, I felt like I was the only one bouncing from poster to poster. And I expected that it would be a bunch of five minute presentations and I could bounce from poster to poster, but maybe we wanna be explicit about that in the future. So that's one thing. But the bigger thing was several of the plenaries, we had um, the, the structure was, so one person asking questions and then all four panelists answering those questions. And in a lot of ways, it was awesome, right? Like we haven't done that kind of thing before. We let four people give their papers and maybe there's some dialogue between them. So it was pretty cool. At the same time, one of the groups in particular, I can't even remember what, was about letting children play, like give them, giving them a, a prompt and then letting interaction happen between them. And I, and I sort of wished that we let a little more inter, a little more, randomness happen instead of the the precise for you know the quest the um, host of the plenary ask the questions and so again I don't know like there's the I the upside of the um host asking the particular questions is a lot gets covered right so in that sense, it was wicked good. And I would have loved to see some of these people kind of really bounce off of each other and let something happen. But that can go in dangerous places. I don't know. I don't know. Eileen, I appreciate that because actually we tried to set it up as the one who invited all these people that it might actually just start bouncing and going. But a lot of folks are new who were in the plenaries on the panels are new to REA. And so we had a, it was a very simple structure with the questions that they then there were sub questions you didn't hear that they were like thinking about doing and we didn't necessarily have an order or anything. But both the format and their their uncertainty about the audience meant that they were a bit more cautious in what they did and they required a little bit more um, um, structure there. But it that was in part the goal was to try to get that and so they were making none of them knew what the others were going to say they were all okay. making connections on the fly but cool. it was not quite as dynamic and and also some of it was you know like um some of them the times were still not 
optimal when you have folks in you know, way different places. But I appreciate it because you picked up on the the intent was to maybe get there. And we got there a little, but not as much as you would have liked. And I, I appreciate hearing that. Well, and something that um, either Russell or Noel said earlier, I think plays an impact on this. And it's um, how can we create a safe space for them? Because they don't know each other, because we live in interesting times. I'll just put it that plainly that, you know, um, roll, I'll, and I'll roll my eyes with that. So we know the interesting times can end up in a darker collision of ideas. So I get people not wanting to take huge risks the first time out because who knows in this culture. We are very close to one minute to four. Um, and so I want to assure you that um, we will find some way, uh, and I'll, I'll look at Mary as I do that, even though she's asking, find some way to make sure this Google Doc is connected to the reflection session online, because um, I think we can add things like that. Um, and, uh, and I'll include a link on the document that you could copy and paste. So if you want to add more stuff to it, we'll treat it as a living document. Because I think these kinds of reflections, both on the content and on the process and on the sort of experience and the questions and the hopes, um, are really valuable to REA um, in terms of um, how we imagine uh, our future next week, next year, and uh, you know, in decades. So thank you all for participating um, and uh, know that you have been heard this time. All right, take care, have a great weekend.